My name's Jeff Arnold. Welcome to all of you. Um, we're going to have a number of speakers over the next 90 minutes, um, some here in the flesh, some um, by video. Um, and there will be some additional speakers uh, above and beyond the list on the, on, on the, uh, on the screen. Uh, and if anyone, want, if anyone has any, has any uh, burning desire for extemporaneous contributions, we'll be very glad to, uh, to accommodate that too. Um, I want to start by, uh, by you know, welcoming you all and handing over to, uh, to Eric Hollis to, uh, to, to welcome us here to Cullen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Eric Hollis. I'm one of the, the directors from the Atomic Energy Authority, and I'd like to, to welcome you all here today. Um, the Authority is extremely pleased to be able to, to host this, uh, this occasion, uh, and I think the um, uh, high regard in which Lorna was held uh, is demonstrated by the, the excellent turnout we have here from a, a wide cross-section of people. Uh, I'm particularly pleased um, to be involved with this because I knew Ar uh, Lorna quite well at one point in the, uh, the old London office days when she regaled me with tales of the, uh, the time when she ran Berlin, which was <laughs> always entertaining. Um, and uh, I also knew her brother, who I've lost. Where's he gone? There he is, looking in the wrong direction. Uh, when we sang together in Stoke-on-Trent, so some relationships. Um, so I, I look forward to, uh, to the rest of the, of the morning's events and uh, hand over to Jeff to get us going. So the first, um, first, first speaker is going to be uh, uh, my aunt, uh, Hillary. I, I, I think it was, you're not Hillary, Billy, <laughs> Billy Simmons, <laughs> um, who, Lorna's sister, writer, um, playwright, and, and, <laughs> and iconoclast, first class. <laughs> right, well. You'll also forgive me, I hope, for the fact that I shall be reading this. It's some time since I was able to do a formal speech without notes and reckon to tailor it to ten minutes or half an hour or whatever. I can't do it anymore, so here we go from the page. It falls to me, as the oldest survivor of her family, to put Lorna Arnold in her setting. Our mother, Lorna Dawson, was a lively young woman who cycled all over Edwardian London and was an active Christian socialist. And imagine the effect she had on bright and ambitious young Kenneth Rainbow when his boss, Aubrey Dawson, took him home to tea. When war was declared, Ken was soon in Ypres. They married during his next leave, each side thinking their own sprig had married down and was headed for the gutter. Sadly, both sides felt vindicated when the crash of 1930-31 to 31 happened. Auntie Polly, mother of only child Reenie, had warned mother on her wedding eve that men are beasts, but you need only let them do it once. <laughs> but Lorna Junior, then called by her second name Margaret for obvious reasons, arrived before the year was out. By this time, Ken was in Howden in Yorkshire, working on the construction of airships. He settled his new family in a hamlet nearby, and her Yorkshire infancy was little Margaret's dream time. She had her bright, devoted mother all to herself, and her daddy was home often. All she wanted was a little sister. It was nearly six years before I arrived, and she learned to be careful what she prayed for. <laughs> That Daddy never returned to his promising career in the city after the war was a case of spelli between the two families for many years, each blaming the influence of the other. He trained instead as a farmer on a government scheme and in 1921 took a lease on East Flexford, a farm near Guildford. We were there for nearly ten years, my dream time. For Margaret, Competition for parental attention from me was bad enough. Worse was the sudden invasion of Daddy's mother, our sole surviving grandparent, and Phil, his sister. They just moved in and stayed. Phil commuting daily to her office job in London. 
I assumed this was just, fam just what families did, but to mother it was a shock she could hardly bear. Margaret, that much older and so much closer to mother, was painfully aware of how hard it was for that spirited woman to knuckle under, as she did for 20 years. Life in the 20s was largely structured by the war. Our schools were almost entirely staffed by grieving women. Moreover, being almost the only post-war children in either family, we had an array of maiden aunts, all anxious for a piece of us. Lorna had two godmothers, the aforementioned Phil and Ditto Rini. They were intensely competitive, and except when Phil took her on her annual summer week, Margaret usually spent her school holidays in Beaconsfield with Rini, a professional violinist and devout Anglo-Catholic. Flexford had all the excitements of the pre-mechanised farming year, interspersed with picnics, where Daddy took his easel to paint, and we all painted too, and everyone was singing all the time. Lorna started school at a tiny church school across the fields, and in 1926 won a scholarship to Guildford County School for Girls, a short bus ride away. In a class with six other Margarets, she adopted her first name, Lorna. Come 1930, a wave of contagious abortion in dairy herds and then the financial crash ruined all but the independently funded local farmers. Lorna's music lessons stopped. Our parents had neither time nor spirit to sing or paint. The daddy took a much smaller farm near Hazelmere, Little Prestwick. I had just started at Guildford County School, having got my scholarship. And by the time we had walked three lonely miles to Whitley Station, spent nearly half an hour on the London train, and walked up the, skill, the, the hill to school, repeating the trip in reverse at half past four, Lorna and I had done nearly an 11-hour day already. And then came the evening meal, including all the farm hands. After the table was cleared, our homework competed for space on the table with tiddlywinks and cocoa and cards. Somehow Lorna always finished hers and caught the train next morning. I often failed both. I was in endless hot water. After two years, she won her scholarship to Bedford College in London, and effectively that was when she left home. Never overlapping with her in school or usually holidays, Rosemary, Ruth and Geoffrey, born at Flexford, hardly knew her but she never lost her sense of being responsible for them in some way. Her upper second was a bitter disappointment to the Bedford staff as well as to her. Deprived of the academic career she had been led to expect, she trained as a teacher in Cambridge. Trying to teach unwilling boys in Belper was not like coaching a young Churchill. She had spent one long back in Blenheim, hired to coach Winston Churchill's youngest daughter. She loved GC, GCS at Guildford, Grand, at Guildford Grammar School. I never did. She was a hard act to follow, topping every exam and the first from the school to achieve university. And five years late, later, I was the second with another Bedford scholarship. A nervous breakdown later, after Belper, Lorna landed back in Cambridge as a wartime temporary civil service clerk in pensions. We were together again. Bedford had been evacuated there. Nearly a year later, in a desperate effort to beef up the war office staff, civil service personnel found her, and I didn't see her again until I got my own upper second and came to London. She was by then Minute Secretary to the Inner War Committee, privy to all the top-level intelligence and counter-planning, and bound for life by the Secrets Act. As we walked to work through the bomb-shattered streets, I had no idea what she was carrying in her head, but I could see its effects in her face. Afterwards, I realised she had been privy to the threat of the doodlebugs and the V2s and the desperate measures being devised to deal with them for many months before they arrived, and she never gave the slightest revealing hint or changed her own behaviour when she knew danger threatened. It was odd to reflect watching the recent programmes on the D-Day preparations, 
that she had prepared the agendas and minuted all those months of meetings. She was able to tell us of the final mad dash to beat the Russians to Berlin, when she, with the honorary rank of major, and her ATS assistant were the only women in the advance party. Meanwhile, the farm, by now at rock bottom, was disposed of at last. The rest of the family moved into London nicely in time for some firebombing and then the doodle bugs. Geoffrey, the youngest, was able to continue his education at Latimer School, but Rosemary and Ruth found themselves in a pre-exam limbo. Rosemary found work in a library, and Ruth was always deeply thankful to Lorna for finding her a physiotherapy course, which led her into a successful career. I told you Lorna always felt responsible. <laughs> After the war, Lorna was transferred to the British Embassy in Washington, where she was accepted as a powerful player, the only woman, I believe, on the British team. But her status was still technically that of wartime temporary civil servant. So at the end of her tour of duty, all she got was a thank you, ma'am, you can go now. I find it hard to believe she would not have been given further postings had she asked. But she had met the young musician, Bob Arnold, and she left, brought Bob home with her and married him. Sadly, Bob left her, and the worst period of her life began, when with two small boys, she was reduced to any old job she could find. Godmothers for the rescue. Rini's death gave them a house, and Phil, now retired, moved in as free housekeeper and nanny. One night, when Lorna was the last to leave the office of the charity now renamed Mind, she couldn't find a confidential paper she had been working on. She left, finally, in such agony of mind that when she saw the open door of a lit chapel, she went in and prayed to St. Anthony, patron saint of lost and found. She told me many times how, with a feeling of deep peace, she went back and there was the document in the middle of her tidy desk. Soon after that, came the chance meeting with an old colleague that led her back to the long-delayed blossoming of her academic career. She'd grieved that our father, Ken, had died too soon to see her success. But others are better qualified than me to speak about that. It was not until we were all widowed, we all had very busy lives, that we all drew close together again. I was often with Lorna during the stresses and strains of her finishing her last major book, and while ill health stopped me driving, it was Ruth and her children who rallied round and supported her and her sons to the end. We Rainbow Girls were a legend in our old school, as we learned much later. In these last years, we came together again in the love and understanding that if you let it, old age can bring. Perhaps, in the end, the greatest of our sister Lorna's great gifts was her wonderful capacity for making friends, for making good friends and keeping them. Over to you. Thank you, Billy. So next, uh, ne the next will be one of those friends, uh, David Holloway um, from Stanford University. I'm very sorry I can't be at the memorial service for Lorna today. I was very glad when Jeff asked me if I would uh, do a video recording of a tribute to Lorna, um, whom I felt it was a great privilege to know. Uh, we first met at a conference in the south of France. The conference was devoted to nuclear history. Margaret Gowing, whom I already knew, uh, was there, but that was the first time I met Lorna, and I immediately realized what good company she was. Uh, it was just great to talk to her. I had known Margaret for about 10 years, and she had given me a lot of encouragement uh, in my work on the history of the Soviet nuclear project. 
And so I was very glad uh, to meet Lorna and apart from her being great company, uh, one of the things that struck me immediately was how interested she was in people. One of the other people at the conference was uh, a Russian physicist, Yuri Smirnov, who had taken part in the development of the Tsar Bomba, the 50 megaton nuclear device that the Soviet Union had tested in 1961. And he had brought with him a documentary film about Yuli Kariton, the Soviet William Penny. And Lorna was absolutely fascinated by that. I think that Britain was very fortunate to have uh, two formidable women as the first historians of the Atomic Project. Uh, Margaret and Lorna worked uh, in very fruitful collaboration on the two-volume book on the independence and deterrence. And after that, I know that Margaret was very frustrated uh, that illness prevented her from continuing to write nuclear history on the grand scale uh, which characterized her first books on the topic. Lorna chose what I think in retrospect was a, a shrewder strategy and that was to write books on specific uh, aspects of nuclear history, specific but very important aspects. The wind scale accident, the tests in Australia and the Soviet, or sorry, the British uh, hydrogen bomb project. The things that came through to me in her writing were, of course, a very high standard of research, uh, a great clarity of exposition, and I think a very important aspect, and that was her interest in the human beings she was writing about. Um, she saw the people as individuals, uh, she empathized with the great responsibilities they had taken on and with the challenges that they faced in dealing with nuclear weapons. Even more important, however, I think, was the integrity of her writing. Uh, she wrote in a very straightforward and a very honest way. And it may seem an odd comment to make to say that her writing reflected uh, integrity but actually I think it's extremely important in writing about the history of nuclear weapons because after all we're writing or the history of nuclear weapons concerns uh, an immense destructive force that we ourselves as the human race have created and that could in fact destroy us so the history of nuclear weapons is a history of how we have dealt with that challenge and because we look to history to draw lessons for the future, it's extremely important that that history be written in a serious way to the highest standards and with a sense of great integrity. And I think that was absolutely characteristic of Lorna's work. That makes her sound very serious and doesn't convey uh, what we all know, which is that she had a great sense of humor and was very lively company. Uh, she came to Stanford, I think about 2001, uh, for a small conference that we organized on the history of the H-bomb projects in the U.S., Britain, and the Soviet Union. This was just after her book, book uh, on the history of the British uh, project was published. Uh, one of the other people at the conference was uh, German Goncharov, a Russian physicist who had taken part in the Soviet H-bomb project as a young man and of course Lorna was fascinated to talk to him. I arranged a meeting with Edward Teller for Lorna and for Goncharov. Uh, we went over to Teller's office here at the Hoover Institution on the Stanford campus and the conversation got off to a very bad start because he said straight away that he couldn't talk about the hydrogen bomb because he didn't know what was classified and what wasn't classified. So it didn't seem as though the conversation would go anywhere. But then he asked what our view was of human cloning. And I think we were all taken aback, but Lorna was the first to answer and to state her position very clearly. Unfortunately, I don't remember what her position was, 
because the conversation took another turn when Teller said that he would like to clone himself. And this took us back once more. And then he explained that the reason for this was that he had one parent who spoke Hungarian and one parent who spoke German. And that he thought that the confusion of the hearing two languages as a young infant had made him interested in numbers and had basically predetermined his, uh, his life as a physicist. Now what he wanted to do was to clone himself but to have two parents who spoke the same language to see if he would make the same choice or perhaps a different choice. Lorna and I recalled this uh, story uh, many times later with both amusement and bemusement. But we don't have human cloning and Lorna was one of a kind uh, and I feel uh, very privileged to have been one of the people who knew her. Uh, she will be, she is greatly missed. The next speaker, um, we're moving from, from, from um, nuclear weapons and, and physics to, to, to history. Uh, and uh, Beatrice Heuser and, and Lorna have been great friends for years. And you know, the, in one of the, uh, one of the uh, big events in, the Lorna, in Lorna's life over, over the, over the, uh, the you know, few, the last few years was uh, something which Beatrice arranged for her and uh, made, made happen. And uh, I, I don't know if you'll, you'll talk about it, but, uh, but it was a, a really, really big event for, a bi and really important for Lorna. Thank you so very much. I have to talk into this little thing as well. We'll clip it on. Right. Okay. Now I'll probably stay here. Okay. It's, um, it's a very great honor to have been asked to talk today. And uh, my uh, acquaintance with Lorna is actually, as I now realize, just as old as that of uh, David Holloway's. Because uh, we too only met at Heathrow um, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, sorry, 20 years ago. Now imagine how many of us are capable of making so many good friends at that age. You know, she must have been, she was well into retirement and she was well um, at that stage over uh, 70. So imagine hitting it off like that. And she said to me very modestly, as was her wont, you see, this is my first international conference. And then she said, well, I suppose not quite. I was at this international conference, you see, in Washington in April 1949, she said. <laughs> it was a conference which produced a treaty, the Washington Treaty, better known as the North Atlantic Treaty. And she was <laughs> in the room when it was signed. Now, I think um, what really has struck me about her career is how the Second World War lifted women, intelligent women, gifted women, into positions of great responsibility and then cut them off again. I'm so impressed at the way in which everybody thought it was normal that uh, very promising diplomats, um, civil servants, etc., would have to retire the moment they got married, which is, of course, what happened with Lorna. Um, but before that happened, the career, the sky seemed to be the limit. And uh, Lorna herself never uh, ceased to mention how much she, gratitude she owed to a particular colonel in the war office who recognized her talents and clearly educated her to unfold them. Many times did Lorna and I reflect on the fact that both of us were promoted by very kind, very um, concerned or very, very encouraging uh, men in our profession. And I think it is sort of important to stress that this whole idea that women had to go back to the home, etc., the moment they got married, um, did not mean that it was in, uh, in total a misogynist society. Curiously enough, there were very many people who encouraged her, and also, uh, as we can see from David Holloway, and in, in fact myself as well. So um, this Im immense uh, and very amazing uh, success story that she had until she got married is an extraordinary, extraordinary part of her life. And I think she should have become a diplomat or, in fact, a don. This occurred to nobody at the time. Um, she had this amazing memory, but I've known many people who can uh, reminisce at great length about all sorts of things. I think the outstanding combination that she had was not just that she had an exceptional memory, but that she had the analy uh, analytic capacity to turn 
what she remembered into something that made sense in a more generalizable way. So we've all been bored to tears by people who give you the battle story over and over, but Lorna would say this matters because, you know, this is illustrative of the fact that, and that's what made her such a fantastic person to listen to. And she was amazingly generous. We've already heard from David Holloway about her rigorous and very uh, marvelous scholarship. Now, she was very generous when other people didn't quite live up to her standards, and I would any time believe her footnotes and books rather than my own. I remember that when she saw my book on the bomb, a sort of student reader thing, um, she said, I really like it, very. it's an admirable book, but you know, you've got this naught wrong on one page. <laughs> you know, just, the, the, yield, the yield of a particular atomic weapon, I have been mortified ever since and humbled. So it's not only this great scholarship that we admire, but as David Holloway always already said, uh, she really did write works that you could rely on 100%. Um, he already went through some of the works, the Independence and Deterrence, which he did with Margaret Gowing, two volumes, uh, the Atomic Bomb with Margaret Gowing, a very special relationship, the British Atomic Weapons Trial in Australia, of which he did two editions, Wind Scale Reactor, Britain and the H-Bomb, Australia and the Bomb. And in all this, actually, um, it's extraordinary, of course, that she still published after she turned blind, and for that she had the help of tremendously uh, kind and supportive friends. Uh, I just wanted to mention in that context Mark Smith, who is here, uh, and Catherine Pine, uh, who uh, were two of the people who helped, but also the, all the people who helped her write down her memoirs, My Short Century. Uh, was actually almost a full century. Um, but uh, her memoirs, incidentally, I find in some respect the most intriguing and the least honest <laughs> of her publications in the sense that she was so diplomatic about it, which is I think she should have become a diplomat, um, that she, we, you have to read an awful lot between the lines. And this is where, uh, as an historian, I can always say, well, this leaves plenty to interpretation. But it's still fantastically illustrative of all sorts of aspects that the public ought to know more about. So it's not just something that for, for her her chums and her friends and her family. In 1993, very shortly after I first met her, after the famous conference in Nice, when in, in fact she flirted madly with a friend, retired French admiral, who was also a charming general, General uh, Admiral Duval, um, she uh, came up to me at King's College London. She said, "Beatrice, I've just done this this you know, new version. I'm working on this new version of my my one of my books, and then then there's Windscale." I was wondering whether I could submit this as a PhD. Now, the stupid rules that we have, of course, makes this impossible because you have to sign up for so many years and you have to pay fees and you have to sit all sorts of stupid preliminary um, exams. And I went to our head of department, uh, Lawrence, now Sir Lawrence Friedman, and I said, Laurie, Lorna wants to do a PhD with us. And he said, why ever would she want to do that? Because we all admire her scholarship. What would that change? So I went back to Lorna and said, look, I don't think there's any point, and particularly you don't want to pay the fees and all the rest of it. Uh, it was only years later that I had the great chance of being able to help her to this honorary doctorate after Professor John Bayliss, of course, tried exactly the same thing at Aberystwyth and failed, but, but presumably as a big donor was in the running that year, which is usually the case. Now, I was successful, presumably because there was no big donor in the year running that year, which is unusual. So, in any case, that was a great pleasure for us, and the University of Reading, in that context, also wanted to honour the achievements of nuclear scientists in the UK. Which brings me to um, one story that is a particular discovery of hers, the story of the Fritch Piles Memorandum. Because this is sort of one of the things that we, you know, all my students come away with, they know that this is, that it changes some, one of those facts about life, factoids about life that they all think they know, um, which is that people always say, ah, oh, it's Einstein who in a letter to Roosevelt said, go build a nuclear weapon. And of course, it's Lorna who discovered that it was these two scientists, one from Austria, one from, from Germany, two refugees at the University of Birmingham, who already in March 1940 wrote a letter to the British government saying, look, build the damn thing for deterrence because the only thing we can do if the Germans develop it, we think they can because we know how to, so they would not know how to because we work together. The only thing we can think of to do in order to ward off this horrible danger is to build the nuclear weapons. And again, Lorna came to me and said, you know, this document is just so beautiful. It is so concisely written. It is so clear. It is such good English, so simple and such good logic, and it's about deterrence. This needs to be published. It will establish, A, who it was who had the initial idea, and it'll finally also establish that it was initially 
as deterrence against the Nazi bomb and not for use in Hiroshima, etc., etc. So we published it bizarrely in Cold War history, but you can now find it on the web and it's uh, otherwise available as well. And I thought that that was remarkable because, again, it gives you an idea of Lorna as a person who appreciated individuals. And I thought what David said was quite, quite right. She was very interested in individuals and she's one of those rare people who doesn't rubber stamp you as, oh, I know that you are of Hungarian descent and therefore for the rest of my life I will quote you as my Hungarian friend or you know, a Hungarian would say X, rather than saying this individual has these opinions which I will take as based on the logic they have developed and on the values they have. And this, this differentiation, I think, is given to very few people. You know, the great majority of people I know will forever brand you as, you know, this is my, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever category they fit into. And I thought that her interest in these nuclear scientists, again, illustrated by what David was saying, was very much of this person, these moral dilemmas, and uh, trying to understand them in that context and really evaluate them on the basis of the logic they, they themselves put forward. And their loyalty in that context as a friend is something that I also wanted to emphasize. I have very rarely heard her say anything at all critical of anybody she knew. Normally she was some one of the most grateful people I've ever come across and it is difficult to be grateful and it is difficult to be really cheerful and grateful for life in general when you are blind, when you are so dependent, when you know that it's going to be a trial for everybody for, for them to help you with things every day etc. But she was so grateful for everything that all of you did for her and I think that made it such a great joy to do anything at all for her and that also I thought needed to be remembered. And finally my daughter wanted me to point out that it is largely due to, I think it was Buttercup, that we are now currently experimenting with vegetarianism. If only Lorna had been around to teach me how to cook vegetarian food, that would have been even better. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Beatrice. The, if you... Uh, if you remember the, the, the beginning of the mem Lorna's memoirs, uh, she actually is quite explicit. She says, this is, there is nothing fabricated here. This is the truth, if not the whole truth. There is, uh, you know, and yes, you know. <laughs> and uh, she, was, she, dip, she was always, always diplomatic, as you said. The next video, and I'll see if I can get this, make sure this launches properly is from another collaborator. Hello, my name is Mike Williams and I am Emeritus Professor of Nuclear Engineering in the University of London. And I suppose that mouthful gives you some idea about how I met Lorna. So let me elaborate. In uh, 1999, I was writing a technical history of nuclear reactor theory in Canada during the Second World War and I'd run into difficulties in tracing certain documents. And a friend suggested that uh, I contact Lorna Arnold, who is the font of knowledge about all things nuclear. I had, of course, read Lorna's book on the windscale accident and those on other matters, so her name was not unknown to me. My letter was passed on to Lorna, who phoned me almost immediately. And after we chatted a bit, she invited me up to Oxford. I suggested we had lunch and she agreed. I arrived at Conifer Close after some pretty difficult roundabouts on the outskirts of Oxford and I met Laura. I believe that Geoffrey was there, no doubt to check that I was not a nutcase, but I must have passed the test because we went for lunch and what a lunch it was. We sat down at 12.30 and we talked until 4pm. I don't recall ever meeting such a charming and charismatic lady in my life and even after 15 years I still look back on those few hours as some of the best. We kept in touch after that and whenever Lorna appeared on TV, which was not infrequently, I would phone her to talk about what she said and get more details. She was always most glad to hear from me and again we could have talked all day. Once my wife said very suspiciously, who is that uh, you're speaking to? But it was just like talking to an old friend. 
As an emeritus professor of nuclear engineering, I was uh, somewhat amused to learn that Lorna was opposed to both nuclear weapons and to civil nuclear power. I must say she was very diplomatic about that with me, and I had no idea of it. Uh, in Lorna's obituary, mention was made of an autobiography, My Short Century, which for some reason I'd missed. I bought it immediately, and it made captivating reading, and I can hear her voice in every line. I was very sad when I'd finished. I wanted more, and there were so many questions I would like to have asked her. As you may have guessed by now, like many others, I was totally bewitched by Lorna, and we can be very grateful for her contributions to the history of my subject and for her kindness to knowledge seekers like myself. My best wishes to Geoffrey and Stephen. What a remarkable mother you had. Goodbye. And we'll, we'll turn off that repeat. <laughs> Yes, I think I must have left it on repeat. So, so far we've, so far we've been, we've heard from people who've worked with Lorna all over the world, but not from her colleagues and within the, the authority. And uh, those of you who know, who know and read, read, read them her memoirs and, and read, talked to her about what motivated her. One of the strongest motivations for a lot of what she did was, was her feeling of responsibility to her colleagues um, from who had provided her with the, the, with the information that she used to create her books, right? She, she, if they, they've trusted me with their story, they've trusted me with their accounts of what they've done, I now have a, a duty, a responsibility to reflect and... and, and, and uh, Honor that 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 trust and, and make sure that the work reflects uh, that that uh, that trust. And so the next uh, next spe speaker uh, is uh, James Retherton, who uh, was a colleague of uh, of Lorna's and will uh, provide that perspective. Oh, good morning, everybody. In, in a way, I think I'm here uh, more as the representative of the employer. As was uh, said, I was former secretary of the Atomic Energy Authority for some 13 years. And um, in fact, I first met Lorna Arnold uh, when I came across from the Department of Energy uh, on a secondment to the AA in 1986. And I, I took over a rather uh, sort of miscellaneous range of responsibilities from Andrew Hills. Now, Andrew Hills is, is here, and I believe is going to say something a bit later. Um, but uh, all I can say is my first impression of Lorna Arnold was in the company of Margaret Gowing. She and Margaret were the authority historians who were paid to write up the, the history of nuclear power and the history of the Atomic Energy Authority. And very shortly after I'd arrived in the London office, as it was then, of the Atomic Energy Authority, Margaret and Lorna appeared in my office. And they spoke 19 to the dozen. <laughs> and I began to look at my watch and think, what about all these other responsibilities that I've got? You know, how am I ever going to get them out again? And it was, I'm afraid, a, a little bit like that. They were just one of a range of things that I had to deal with. But of course, since the, the, we were paying and the government was paying us, I had to take some further interest and I had further discussions with Lorna and Margaret. And um, I always felt at a distinct disadvantage, despite the fact I have a history degree, because they were so knowledgeable and they talked so rapidly and it was very difficult not to agree with them. <laughs> um, however, a little bit later, not much later, I was asked to look at the book on the wind scale far before it was published. 
I mean, I guess the idea was that we might somehow find something, we, the Atomic Energy Authority, which was an objectionable in this book, and we'd have to go back to Lorna and say, you know, it's got to be removed or something's got to be done. So I remember uh, quite vividly taking this book down over Christmas uh, in its pre-publication form to our family cottage down in Devon. And I thought, well, this is something, a job I've got to do. Oh dear, you know, it's going to take up time. Only to find when I started reading, it was absolutely gripping. And it was a really good read, beautifully set out, very informative. And I realized that there was no question of objecting to anything. This was absolutely super. And of course, the book was a, a great success and contributed greatly, I think, to Lorna's reputation. Now, in later years, sadly, the government funding of uh, nuclear history faded away, as the government funding of most things faded away in the nuclear field. And they're not fusion, I'm glad to say. Uh, and and um, uh, Lorna didn't like that, naturally. And in the memoir, you, you will find some reference to that. But that was the way, the way it was. And it didn't prevent her uh, continuing. I think she actually got some help from the Ministry of Defence uh, and the, the book on Britain and the H-bomb came out as another great, great success. Um, in a way, uh, I have a, a big regret and that is that it's only recently that I became aware of her memoir. And like the previous speaker by video, I read it and was fascinated by her early background, the enormous, the enormous difficulties she, she had to overcome, uh, her very considerable brilliance and her time as a single mother and so on. And I didn't really know any of that. And I regret uh, that I, have, I didn't uh, keep up the professional relationship which I had with her uh, through my time in the Atomic Energy Authority. I did speak at one of her retirement, uh, retirement parties, but there were several retirement parties actually, <laughs> and she never really retired at all. So that um, uh, I might perhaps have kept up with her, particularly as she was quite a close neighbour. I live off Cumnor Hill, she was in Conifer Close. So all I can say is I'm left at the end uh, with some, a few vivid memories of my professional relationship with this very extraordinary, very talented and very memorable woman. Thank you. The next memory comes from someone who ra actually rarely saw Lorna and uh, um, it's a video tribute, and as you'll see, it's, that's a rather appropriate way of doing it. When I first realised that I wouldn't be able to attend today's memorial service for Lorna, I was, of course, disappointed. But then, as I thought about it, in fact, our friendship had mostly been based on transatlantic phone calls. So there is something fitting in me paying my tribute from a distance. I first met Lorna about 20 years ago when I was researching my biography of James Chadwick, the physicist who discovered the neutron. I went to see her in her office at Harwell and explained that uh, I'd never written a book before and I wasn't a physicist and I wasn't um, a historian of science and she said, oh, none of that matters. She said, uh, Chadwick's such an interesting man and such an important figure that a biography of, is long overdue. And she then proceeded to give me endless pointers, recommendations and contacts, all of which were uh, uh, extremely useful. Um, at the end of our conversation, I said to her that I'd uh, interviewed uh, Joe Rotblatt in his pugwash office in London a few days before. Now, Rotblatt had worked with Chadwick both in Liverpool and on the Manhattan Project but in 1950 turned his back on academic nuclear physics and applied for a job as a medical physics professor at Bart's Hospital. Well, the ranks of British uh, nuclear physicists didn't want to see him go, 
and persuaded Chadwick to phone him to try to dissuade him. And he, Chadwick's most powerful point on the phone was that uh, if you make this move, Joe, you'll never become a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, whereas I think you stand a good chance if you stay at Liverpool University. And Rob Black looked at me very wistfully and said, and you know he said Chadwick was right, I never became a fellow. So Lorna said, oh, she said, it's such a scandal, really, the way that chance plays a role in people's um, recognition for their, for their work. Uh, she said, I'm going to talk to Rudy about this and see what he could do if he's, if he's well enough. Rudy, of course, was her great friend, Sir Rudolf Piles, who at that time was undergoing renal dialysis. But nevertheless, he organised a uh, campaign and proposed Ropplet as a fellow of the Royal Society. And within a year, he'd been elected, I think, as the oldest new fellow in the 400-year history. I tried to do something for similar. I tried to do something similar for Lorna a few years ago, when I decided that uh, she really deserved a CBE. Margaret Gowing had had one, and Lorna had produced these wonderful books, and had worked for the government or had worked uh, in public service for years. So I wrote a letter to the uh, honours committee, and also enlisted the. Uh, enthusiastic support of Nigel Scheinwald, who was then the British ambassador in Washington. Um, we had a reply from some Jobsworth on the committee to say, we noticed that Mrs. Arnold is many years beyond retirement age, and we don't, um, we don't credit the career of um, people so long in the past. And it did absolutely no good when I pointed out that she really hadn't started writing her books until she was in her 70s. Uh, one other anecdote about the Chadwick book, the uh, launch party was held at uh, Gonville and Keys, thanks to the generosity of the then master Peter Gray, and Lorna came. I have some photos from the occasion, which are mostly of my friends drinking wine and eating canapes, and in one there is a picture of Lorna, who knew more about Chadwick, of course, and uh, British uh, nuclear affairs than anybody else in the room and she's actually standing reading the book. Uh, she was such a great enthusiast for her subject. I really got to know her well when I was writing my second book, The Sage of Science, which is about the uh, x-ray crystallographer and communist J.D. Banal. And this period coincided with the time when Lorna um, sadly lost her vision very rapidly and she said to me although I can get talking books I can't get the sort of books I want to read and I said would you be interested in hearing about Banal and she said yes rather so we got into this routine that when I'd finished a chapter as soon as I'd finished it I would phone Lorna and read it to her and she was so helpful and not only would she provide me with a unique sort of historical perspective, uh, she would also edit the chapter in her head as we were going along. And having never seen the text at the end of a long chapter would say, I think near the beginning you had a cliche that really needs to come out. And then you repeated something uh, several pages later. And she could do the whole thing in her head without having ever seen the text. Uh, I was sort of reminded of how lucky I was a few years ago when uh, I met a man who'd just written a biography of General Zukov at a meeting in Vienna. And I said, ah, I said, my friend Lorna Arnold met Zukov in Berlin after the war and used to go to uh, meetings with him. And she told me the great thing was that he had the most beautiful blonde translator. And when Ever Zukov was asked a question, he would give his answer in Russian. And by the end of his answer, the translator was in fits of laughter and slapping her thigh and would start off her translation by saying, the general is a very witty man. And I could tell from the biographer's face that this was an aspect of the general's character that had never been brought to his attention. 
anyway, uh, while uh, I was writing the Bernal biography, I went to see a production of Measure for Measure in Washington. And I said to Lorna, there was a line in the play which reminded me of Bernal, which was, they say best men are moulded out of faults. And she said, Measure for Measure is a very interesting play. She said, I haven't read it for about 40 years. And then proceeded to give me the most fascinating exposition of why Measure for Measure is an important play because of its political connotations and it, the way it deals with the law and corruption. And she said, and there is that wonderful speech by Claudio on death. And so I'm going to read you that, if I may. I but to die and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot, this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod, and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the, pendulant, the pendant world, or to be worse than the worst of those that lawless and incertain thought imagine howling. Tis too horrible. The weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. Lorna's, one of Lorna's favourite sayings was T.S. Eliot, which was, uh, humankind cannot bear too much reality. She, I think, was um, always courageous in the uh, way she looked at life and experienced life. Uh, she was a great humanist and a very wise woman. And I miss her. Okay. I'm going to stop with you. I apologise for the video. I'm a Mac user. This is a Windows machine. I haven't used Windows in years. Um, yes. The next speaker. Yes. <laughs> is somebody who was such, I, 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 you, I, you, may be talk, you may talk about this, but I just want to thank you for, for, being, for being such a wonderful friend to Lorna during the final weeks. That was just, uh, touched us all deeply. Thank you. Um. Uh, I saw myself quite late on the running order and thought um, they will all have said everything I would say. And, and there's a lot of truth in that. Um, Andrew's experience of uh, encountering her and saying, I want to write this book. And, uh, you know, as he said, he was, you know, not a physicist, not a historian, um, no track record. Um, I, my, my story is, is, is more extreme than that in a way. Um, in 1990, I uh, somehow decided that I was going to write a book about uh, making the first British atomic bomb. Um, I had absolutely no qualification of any kind to do this thing. And I went off to the public record office and found what records there were there, which were not bad. And, uh, but I realized that there wasn't a book in it. That was, you know, this was uh, basically admin that I had a record of. You could animate it to a degree, but it was, it was not a human story. Um, and I wrote to the MOD, amazing that I <laughs> thought this would be a smart thing to do. And lo and behold, I found myself in a meeting with uh, two people. One was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's Frank McTaggart, is that right? Um, Mike McTaggart, um, uh, uh, who was the director of science, I think, at, uh, at the MOD. And, uh, and the other was Lorna, who I, no, I had the book. Oh, here am I, I'm going into this room, I'm proposing to rewrite her book, as, as it were. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I didn't really connect her with the co-author of, of, of Independence and Deterrence. And so I sit down, and I don't know how I blundered through that meeting, um, but somehow I did. Well, I do know how I blundered through that meeting, because Lorna more or less took me by the hand and sorted it out. And uh, the result was, the MOD agreed, 
um, Mike agreed to uh, put me in touch with uh, 20 or 25 of the veterans of the, of the Hurricane Project. And uh, th from there, I was able to write a book. And of course, by then, I was in touch with Lorna. And uh, it would have been utterly impossible to write this book without her help and guidance. And uh, it was the beginning of one of the happiest friendships of my life. Um, I should say, by then, what, how old was she? She was 75. That, I mean, extraordinary. Um, now, the thing we all know because we're here is that Lorna was a social network. Um, she just had a, an ability to connect with people. I mean, we've, we've spoken about, you know, we've heard about the, the, the humanity. She had an ability to connect with people and stay connected and build connections and, you know, as, as I think it was Andrew said, continue to build them um, to, uh, until she was nine. So, you know, those Sunday evening, I don't know when you got your phone calls. I tended to get my phone calls on Sunday evenings. Um, and, uh, and you'd sit down and, well, first of all, she, of course, got to know my entire family because I didn't always answer the phone. So she, by then she had, you know, by the time I spoke to her, she'd had a substantial conversation with my son or my younger son or my wife. And eventually I got to sit down and talk to her. And it would be partly a, a little reminiscence, partly inquiry, of course, about what I was doing. And, and she was absolutely fascinated by, you know, I do various things, so fascinated by everything I did and kept a very clear memory of it. And, uh, and also um, uh, reports on the new people she'd met, or the old people she'd just been speaking. So, you know, I heard um, echoes, I mean, she was discreet, but I heard echoes of, of Andrew's books from those chapters that she'd heard from, and uh, she was saying, you'd never believe this about Bernal. Uh, and, and it was just wonderful. And I mean, we've all shared that, and it, it was just wonderful, and I do, I do miss it terribly. Um, the, the connections, you know, she was clearly meeting new people and, and, and um, delighted and excited about them um, right up to the end. Um, still recommending books, even though she couldn't read them. Um, books, some of them books from 50 years ago that she said, you, um, this measure for measure thing, complete recall. Um, did you ever read that? Of course I hadn't. They would always be terrific. Um, and they, then the, the, the line which I, you probably got, which is, uh, you know, I mustn't waste your time. <laughs> Remember that? I must wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, she, um, the, there's some, something else which I just thought I would, I would her history is built, and, and I thought uh, David Holloway made a tremendous point about the importance of nuclear history. And Lorna's history is built from the people up. It is always, um, you talk to her about the, the approaches she took, the way she did. It was always about talking to people. It was always, here was a woman who was born in the world of records, as it were. This was her, her, her great achievements in the, in the war. She was a, a, you know, a, 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 you know a, an, admin, an admin genius. But uh, when it came to the history books, it was always about people. And she always remembered the people and connected the people and there were these, you know, um, uh, she, she, she was always, I was going to say, she was always kind. She could be waspish. Um, I mean, I, there are two, I, I'll mention two who were fair game. One was Teller, um, uh, 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 but the other was Margaret Thatcher. She didn't really much <laughs> rate Margaret Thatcher. Um, but apart from those are maybe a couple of others. She was, she was extraordinarily kind and generous um, and uh, always saw the best in people, um, but not in a dim way. Um, and I think I, it's always in my mind that the Windscale book did something special. The other books, you know, they're, they're all special, of course, in their ways, but with the Windscale book, she, she went and looked at something that had been a controversy for so long and had been misunderstood so fundamentally for so long. And she did it from the people up, and she wrote something that is an, a model of fairness and, uh, 
and you know a book you can go back to again and again and 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 get you know get it right and as Holloway says it's tremendously important that we get that right we understand this story of all stories um, properly um, I'll just pick up to finish one word well two 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 points one word from from uh, Mike Williams, bewitched. I think it was the word. I mean, from way, way back in that meeting at the MOD, she was just wonderful. Uh, she cast a spell. Uh, there was no doubt about it. And the last thing I would say is just to, to thank Jeff and the family for a fantastic event. It's so tremendous to be able to come here and, and share this, but also hear, hear so much. Um, and, uh, you know, this, to think the age of this woman filling a room like this. It's just tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, the, it, it, I mentioned that, 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 that I had uh, uh, put together a provisional list of speakers, but, uh, and the, but, but I, I had missed a couple of names, and I do apologize for that. Um, and the uh, one that I'd missed was uh, Andrew Hills. Being slotted in at the end of an event like this is a little daunting. I'll do my best not to try and uh, repeat things, but there are some memories I'd like to add uh, of my time with Lorna, which extended over quite a period. The earliest memory I have of Lorna comes, I believe, from early 1974. I had been appointed as the private secretary to John Hill, the chairman of the authority at that time, and one of my duties was to take notes of the meeting of the slightly pretentiously named The Authority, which was the main board. I decided I needed to go and look at past minutes, partly for a specific query to do with that perennial joy reactor choice, and partly because I thought it would be, do me good to look at some predecessors. I went down... Uh, in the wake of some experiences which were a little bruising. I had taken the view that the minutes of the board should be principally a concise record of the topics considered and the decisions taken. If it was in that spirit that my minutes dealt with discussions by just noting that they had taken place, sometimes with a little bit of adjectival enhancement, such as short, long, or just occasionally lively. <laughs> As I'd followed this trend to increasing succinctness, it was conveyed to me that some of the participants in the discussions felt that their remarks merited further, fuller treatment. So I went down to consult Lorna for her views. With great patience and, as you will have expected from what's been said, an impeccable command of her material, she showed me how, in her view, the best minutes had been produced, and particularly how individual contributions could be identified where they were unexpected or influential in determining the final outcome. I learned a great deal, put this, these messages into effect, and managed to give rather better satisfaction. Uh, I have to say I do have some more, more sympathy with those who were complaining about the lightness of my touch, having got a Christmas card from a reviewer who said that he'd been going through some of my material and that it was very interesting but not historically significant. <laughs> I thought that summed up things quite nicely. Two other anecdotes I will throw in from those days of the, the early 70s. Uh, John Hill, as some of you may know, uh, was a particularly phlegmatic character. Very little could throw him. Uh, but I do remember he was reduced to a state of significant nervousness when he was to receive a visit from Lord Hinton, who was carrying out a review on the fast reactor. Uh, it was therefore quite a revelation in reading Lorna's memoirs to see that the same terrifying Lord Hinton was 
getting himself in and out of her small car to go and visit parish churches. This, this puts things into perspective with Lorna's gift for friendship. The other, I hope not too indelicate, memory I have was the time that there was the great controversy over lavatory paper. <laughs> this was led by Margaret Gowing, with Lorna in support. This was in the early days of the move to the softer, kinder tissues. But alas, the Authority Standards Committee had met, had considered, had taken views from the Authority Chief Medical Officer and had concluded that both economy and utilitarian and indeed good health argued for the retention of the rather more abrasive sort. <laughs> Margaret, Lorna and one or two others did not agree. I do not have to tell you who won. <laughs> I should just go on to say a little bit more about my next dealings with Lorna, uh, which came in the mid-1980s. Uh, by then I had learnt of her considerable abilities, not least from detecting through my reading of Independence and Deterrence, the lively interest in people and the good effect that had on her history writing, which has been commented by people who are particularly close to that side of her. We've also had reference to the advent of the trading fund in the mid-1980s, which required all the work of the authority to be put into quasi-contractual relationships, and this was not welcomed quite widely across the authority. Indeed, I remember a very hard time I had at Risley trying to convince them that they had to do this for the Fast Reactor Programme. That was on a somewhat different scale to the historian's office, but it was equally unwelcome there. The idea of defining milestones and targets was seen as unhelpful and, more importantly, incompatible with the ethos of official history as had been defined during the Second World War by Professor Hancock and his colleagues. But it could not be avoided. Uh, particularly as it was a delicate moment because it had become apparent for a mix of reasons that the successor volume to independent deterrence was not going to appear. This was going to be exposed by the, the, tr the trading fund disciplines. Lorna, as you would expect, responded with great determination and resilience to this situation. This lay behind the move to the top specific topics which rapidly demonstrated that these were two important issues to be left just mouldering away in the archives. And it also demonstrated that Lorna had a breadth of view and an ability to convey an outcome from a range of sources, which I think is very unusual. I'm sometimes asked, as a lapsed historian myself, why anybody should study history. And I sometimes say, well, it's a good training in taking a few facts and building from those a good hypothesis and a good case. And that's a skill that will come in handy across a range of uh, occupations. But it's a much rarer skill, but one that Lorna had in great measure, to take a huge array of sources, to boil them down, and to go back to a version of the truth which all the variety of sources then agree has represented their position quite adequately. And I think I wish that that sort of skill was perhaps rather more widely uh, available. Uh, it's one regret that I have is that the pressures on her later years were ones which reflected, as James Retherton has said, a general reluctance to fund anything if it was to be worthwhile, then the market would buy it, wouldn't it? And if it wasn't going to be bought in the market, then it was by definition not worthwhile. Uh, this, I think, is a very sad uh, way of viewing the potential of a public sector, but that's another argument. From Lorna's point of view, the important thing is that she never gave up hope that the right ways forward for an official history of nuclear efforts would be reinstated. And in 2000, she published a remarkable series of proposals for how the whole enterprise could be resuscitated. Uh, I'm sure you'll all join me in hoping that that vision 
will be realised before too long. But in the meantime, I'm very grateful, Jeff, for this opportunity to pay tribute to a very splendid historian and a very remarkable woman. Thank you very much. These are tough acts to follow. These are tough stories to follow. These are, this is, this is, here's, in my closing, I was trying to think what, what I would want to add, what could I say at the end of, 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 of something like this. Um, Kate knows that I went through a whole bunch of different topics and do I, did I want to talk about the philosophy of Lorna's work, the, the moral core of that work? That uh, sound, sounded a little bit heavy. Um, so, here's an. To me, she was just my mother, right? People who, when you're living in a family with with with, with somebody who's doing extraordinary work in in in, in their professional and uh, and social life, often people inside the family never really see or appreciate that. That, 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 that you know, go, oh. Oh, you're on the phone again, you know, <laughs> get, get off, get up, come, come join us. Um, and I remember vividly the first time that, that I appreciated that bewitchment that people have referred to, that magic. Um, so in 1969, I went up to uh, Essex University as an undergraduate, um, having spent a year working at Harwell. Um, and the... Uh, and, and Lorna drove me over there with a, with a, a car full of gear to uh, to get set up in the uh, the uh, with the residential tower blocks um, that they just constructed at Essex, the big uh, you know towering uh, towering uh, student accommodation, still a lot of study study bedrooms around a common uh, kitchen and and, re and recreational core. And so she drove me there. And I started unloading stuff from the car and get, lugging it up to my room. And I don't know, what, I had no idea where she'd gone. I thought she might have gone, you know, gone to the loo or something like that. And uh, I, kept, I kept on unloading the car and, uh, and getting, my, getting my room set up. And finally, when everything was unloaded, I went looking for her. And I found her in the kitchen uh, dining room area of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the this, our floor holding court surrounded by six or seven undergraduates, one grad student, who were just spellbound <coughs> by her, talking about, talking about history, talking about politics, particularly talking about politics. I mean, 69, it was a, it was a, pretty, a, a pretty lively time politically. And you know, when she had left, they, you know, I remember them coming and saying, your mother's incredible. Well, <laughs> you know, she, she could talk about anything. Is, 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 that what, is that what it's going to be like here at university? Is she like the, like the, academic, the professors here? And I said, I have no idea. And I didn't even know that she was incredible. And I watched it, and I watched it, and I watched it, and, and that magic is, was just extraordinary. And, Brian, uh, I mean, you, you, your comments about, the, about being on the, fo on the phone to her, I was always in the States. Um, Calling it, I got to know that message so well. The BT call my message. The person you are calling is on the phone. <laughs> over and over, I go, and every time I call Lorna, she the, her, she was on the phone to somebody else, um, and uh, it was you know, you know, finally managed to get through. And uh, and she, of course, she was uh, so apologetic, but she was always on the phone, and that was that was fantastic. The memoir was something that we talked about for so many years. I did normal history with her back in uh, back in the late nineties, about ninety nine, I think it was. Uh, literally, two, literally two weeks of of, of uh, audio recording every conversation we had for for, two, for, for you know during the day, um, and then had it trans transcribed, and uh, and we you know. We talked about, the, and she had the very firm uh, ideas about what she wanted to, 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 uh, 
to have in that book. Um, but uh, things kept going, going getting in the way, health issues, um, you know, collaborating with, that, with various people in that some, that some worked, some didn't, we started and stopped. And finally, we, uh, you know, we just had to set, it, you know, set a deadline and, uh, and, make, and, make, and make it happen. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that she, I'm glad that we did. Um, she was not delighted by that book. She had things she wanted to improve. She was never satisfied with the quality of the work because for her, to get, getting things absolutely right was, was, was extraordinarily important. And uh, uh, that, that's something which, uh, which I think all of us felt, all of us felt in, in, in working with her. And that's all I have to say. Thank, I want to thank you all for coming. Yeah. This is yes. One story I'm dying to tell. <laughs> of course. And nobody else has told me. So may I tell it? Of course. And I hope, I hope so you, well, you want to story? The stories. <laughs> All, okay, oh, we can pass the microphone around. We can all tell our, 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 our lot of stories. Um, and Look, I'll, I'll, I'll just perch on the table. I, I really expected somebody else to tell this story because she told it to me. Just hold it. Just hold it. I'll just hold it. Right. I don't really need it, do I? It's not. 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 This goes back to when she was in hospital having a bowel op. And it was a serious op in the um, hospital in, um, in, in Oxford. And she told me, Ruth and I took turns to look after her after she came out. And it, she told me then um, that the morning after the operation, she was with curtains all round her and all strung up with tubes and wires and you name it, you know, as, as you are in these circumstances. And there was a young man in the bed next to her, she couldn't see him of course, but he had a lot of visitors. And one of the visitors arrived late. She had the impression that the young man worked in some form of the media, but she didn't know what. But this young friend told me, she said, you know, I've had such a terrible shock. Coming into this hospital, I have discovered that there are people here, over 70, having serious uh, treatment on the, on the, at the expense of all of us, on the NHS, expensive operations, etc., etc. Now, for what purpose? What possible um, enjoyment of life is there for them? What quality of life? What can they contribute? And Lorna said to me, I could not resist, but I spoke from behind the curtains. He must have sounded like the voice of God. <laughs> and, uh, you can hear my voice, or Lorna could produce a similar voice. And she said, I am 89. I have just had very expensive surgery, courtesy of this wonderful hospital, at the expense of the NHS. I cannot wait to get out because my students are waiting for me and my publisher is breathing down my neck. <laughs> Jay. Right. Well, uh, I'm not going to attempt to cap that, but, <laughs> but uh, there are aspects of Lorna's life that were extremely important to her and probably of no importance whatever to most of the people in this room. But they mattered to her. And I think it's worth a mention that she had a deep love and understanding of the arts in general and particularly of music. She loved music. She, one great regret of hers was when she was no longer physically able to sing she was she had the extraordinary experience of being in Cambridge when Boris Ord discovered Talis's forty part motet. He discovered it as separate parts in various libraries around the university. He gathered them together and discovered that it was a great work, and he handed these individual copies out to individuals of whom Lorna was one. 
So he found 40 people who could sing. And the first time that work was ever heard since Tallis's time was in King's, in King's College Chapel. They were performing in the evening. They met in the afternoon and rehearsed it. And no, none of them had ever heard it before. And they were amazed. And it was a, a, a wonderful performance. And I, I'm, I'd like to add that almost exactly 70 years ago, uh, 70 years after that, I had the privilege of taking part in a performance of that same work, which was a great thrill to me. Uh, yes, she, she loved music, and I'd like to say that her, her younger son is, is, was and is a fine musician, an exceptionally talented musician. One of his talents is not the ability to perform in public. He couldn't do it. He, he, he really broke down and nothing happened when he tried to perform in public. Otherwise, he could have been an outstanding musician. And Lorna, among the other things that she could have been, was an outstanding musician. She, she was a lovely singer and very, very musical. As you heard, her music lessons ceased for financial reasons. That, that was part of it. Of the music that she, she loved, the music of Christian religion was her, her greatest love. And indeed, it was an aspect, not the only aspect, of Christian religion that was of enormous importance to her. Jeff has talked about the, the, the moral backbone that she showed and that had not a little to do with that rather odd but deep religious faith that she had and I, I know that there are one or two people here from from her the church that she was in touch with right right to the end and I'm we are most grateful to those people that they brought the, the comforts of religion to her right to the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. While, while I have the microphone here, and I'm, if, 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 does anyone else want to uh, have a comment or an anecdote or a, a, mem some, a memory? I think well we can you know we the we we the next thing after this is the next thing after this is 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 lunch and we can we, we have the flexibility to to, to to allocate our time as we want unless they kick us out i don't know if Nixon kick us out. <laughs> my name is richard hay and i haven't got words spoken uh, words prepared to speak but i wanted to follow Brother Jeffrey's remark about Lorna's faith to explain that Lorna was my godmother in 1940. Um, I was baptized quite late, I think, so 1944 or something like that. I'd been aboard a couple of years earlier. Uh, Lorna and my father and my mother met through the accidents of war. But, and we didn't see a great deal of Lorna, I have to say. After uh, my parents moved, and I moved to Edinburgh and they stayed there for the rest of their lives but they kept up regularly in contact and Lorna never forgot me. I have to say that perhaps it were, I was less faithful as a godson than she as a godmother but I would receive copies of her books, the occasional card and after we came back from living abroad, living in Brussels for a long time, uh, we did resume contact from time to time and that can only, I, on that I can only repeat for, on behalf of my wife and myself everything that others who knew her much better have already said. But uh, I just wanted to add that further dimension to this very wonderful person. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. This is a great group. I, 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 
Do you want to say something quite different? We, yes, I mean, this is, this is... And now something completely different, Monty Python is quite exactly right. <laughs> Come on. This is going to be completely different. Um, I'm Agma Keith, and I'm one of the people who helped Lorna to produce her memoir in the end when she couldn't see any more. I'd come round and we'd have lengthy conversations about them and then she'd dictate what she wanted to say. And I was, I'm a Catholic too, and I was very struck by the... We had very similar attitudes to being a Catholic, which is to say we shared uh, a cringing feeling every time anyone mentioned the Pope. Uh, <laughs> she was very relieved that eventually we got a Pope who wasn't quite so bad and all the various other things that the Catholic Church does that make you cringe. Um, but nevertheless, she remained staunch, and so do I, and we did encourage each other a bit. And I was, in learning about her memoir and her life, I was aware that there were bits that weren't in it. Um, although I didn't necessarily know what they were, because she didn't necessarily share them with me. But one thing that has sort of slowly emerged is that the dire straits that she was in in the 1950s, when she was terribly ill after her second child was born and had to have a hysterectomy. So she was absolutely on her knees, and it was round about then that her husband decided that he couldn't maintain the, the story that he was the loving father of a, a happy family and so on, and that he had to go back to America and acknowledge and live with the fact that he was gay. And... I, I, it's, it's slowly coming through to me that she picked up, round about them, a contact with the Jesuits. I think Stephen said a little bit about it, and I never really heard more than this. But she picked up some kind of contact with the Jesuits, which encouraged her and gave her hope, and gave her strength and stamina to deal with the desperate crisis that she was in, um, and kept her upright, really until such time as she went through the various jobs that you will have read about in her memoir, because I'm sure everybody here must have read it, um, kept upright. And then finally that magical moment when she bumped into Colonel Plum, or whatever his name was, who said, why, why are you doing that? You ought to be doing something more useful. I think I know the job for you, which was not, in fact, the Atomic Energy Authority. It was um, some other thing, but, yeah, quite... By a devious route, she got to the Atomic Energy Authority through his intervention. And so uh, that's the little bit that I wanted to mention, because it's not come up anywhere else. And if anybody knows anything about that, do come and tell me. I'll be really interested to hear. Uh, she was wonderful. I was so glad to have known her. She opened the door on so many different things that I hadn't thought about before. I now know quite a lot about the Second World War and about the position of women afterwards, and about um, uh, farming in the, in the 1920s. Um, and and I, don't, I was going to say something else, but I can't remember what it was, but thank you for listening to me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mike. Martin. more or less had enough of listening. But I, I was just going to share, um, I should say, uh, Lorna was my aunt. I'm her eldest nephew. Um, my mother was her middle sister, Rosemary. And I was just remembering the last time um, I remember the two of them speaking together. Uh, somebody had come round to read to Lorna um, and she had for some reason said to whoever it was who was going to read to her, how about some Chaucer? And I suspect it was probably some poor nuclear physicist <laughs> <laughs> who was trying to read Chaucer to her and Lorna rang my mother up afterwards and said, do you know, they don't pronounce Chaucer the way we were taught to in Guildford Grammar School. <laughs> and they started, and Lorna was, and there's these two old biddies, one of them blind and bedridden. My mother already, sad to say, quite, demen quite showing signs of dementia. Um, and they started reciting Chaucer to each other. 
I was lying on the floor trying to stuff a cushion into my mouth to stop <laughs> laughing. They went for over half an hour of just from memory. The two I of them. Really the two of them. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and nice, actually, that, I think they started with a nice, there was the, that a worldly man, and, and just went on from memory. It was extraordinary performance. I'm quite glad to have watched it. <laughs> anyway, just to share. <laughs> Memory seems like a good note to end on. I think we all have wonderful memories, and uh, that's why we're here. We we have lunch in the next uh, in the uh, in the foyer uh, for until uh, one thirty. Um, at that point, there is a tour of the jet Taurus experiment for. A few people. They, the the column can only accommodate. Um, uh, we, they said twelve. I managed to get it up to fourteen. Um, and uh, those, uh, I'll put the names up in, in just a second. Um, but that 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 starts at one thirty. Thank you so much for coming. And if you've got thought, if any any thoughts you want to 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 leave, <coughs> write in the book, post it on 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 this website. Uh, we'll keep that website going. We're going to put materials from today um, up on the website because there was a lot of people who wanted to be here but couldn't. I mean, I think, f you know, my, I, I don't have, a, have an exact count, but something like 40 or 50 people contacted me saying they wanted to come but couldn't. And all I can do is to, you know, assemble the material, try and share it with them, let them experience some of what we've had here this morning. So thank you so much. <laughs>